So Melanie, we are seeing patients in the clinic who we have concerns for thyroid cancer. Let's say, for example, a woman comes in and she might not even be seeing me for a thyroid issue, but we talk and I do a physical exam and there's either a very visible lump in her neck thyroid or something that I feel on exam. How do I proceed in terms of having her see you or see radiology for the next steps? That's a great question, Rose. So here at St. John's, we have a little bit of a unique setup, um, which most of the time is really nice for patients. So you can just send them directly to me in my clinic and I will do an ultrasound with them right in the clinic. If we need to do a biopsy, we'll do it right then and there. The pathologist actually looks at the slides while they're still sitting in clinic. So not all the time, but a lot of the time we can come up with a plan and answers right when they're seeing me on that first visit. We can bypass a lot of this in-between waste of time going back and forth to radiology before you get to me. So that's a really nice thing that we have. Once they have a diagnosis of cancer, we discuss all the next steps, surgery, et cetera, before I send them back to you. So at the end of that first visit and consultation with you, they might know whether everything's completely clear, or they should know whether everything's completely clear or whether they have a diagnosis of thyroid cancer? We will have an idea of if it's definitely benign, definitely cancer, but sometimes for thyroid, there's this I don't know answer. And then we have to send it out for special testing, which does take a couple weeks. So that's the one time where I don't really know when they're sitting there. I would say at least 50% of the time we know for sure while they're there. So that's really nice for patients. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, because I start, a lot of times they see me first for cancer. I give them the diagnosis and I start talking them through the steps of, you know, what their journey is gonna be and what we're seeing. But the patients always ask me, am I gonna be the same person once my thyroid is out, if I have to take it all out? Like, is thyroid hormone gonna make me fat, make my hair fall out? So what do, I, what, what do you tell patients when, once they come to you and they ask that question? Yeah, so that's a really a very common concern because people hear that their thyroid will be removed and they hear about thyroid hormones being necessary. So what I generally tell people is that when their thyroid is out, then yes, they have a permanent condition of hypothyroidism. However, when they're in the hospital, um, I think generally you're gonna discharge them on a prescription for thyroid hormone. Correct. So they essentially never have a drop in hormone levels to reach a hypothyroid state. Now the dose of thyroid hormone they get started on may not be the exact optimal dose, but it ensures that they remain um, at adequate levels and again, don't drop into hypothyroidism. And the concerns that people often have with hypothyroidism is that they hear that, right, they're gonna have weight gain because of slowed metabolism, um, they're gonna have hair changes, or they might feel very fatigued or have difficulty with thinking, like a brain fog sort of sensation. But again, I try to reassure them that we're never gonna let their hormone levels drop to any significant level because it's from, you know, the one day they have their surgery, thyroid is out, they still have circulating levels of hormone in their body and then they start on thyroid hormone the very next day. So hypothyroidism really shouldn't be a concern as long as they're taking the prescribed medication. And what about patients also ask me, well, what if I still don't feel well? Do you only go by the numbers? Do you also go by how I'm feeling? Do you have some different things you can do for patients that are having, think that they're having trouble, should I say? Yeah, so it is a lot about the numbers because depending on the, let's say, likelihood of recurrence or the risk, you know, low risk versus a high risk thyroid cancer, we do look specifically at treating at higher doses of thyroid hormone to result in what we call TSH suppression to reduce uh, the likelihood of recurrence of, of any kind of thyroid tissue. We do look very closely at the numbers. Uh, if the people who don't feel well, then I certainly welcome other um, treatments besides thyroid hormone. Um, this might be, I guess, non-Western modalities. This might be maybe not just strictly looking at medication. There's really only so much medication um, of a dose that we can give before you're really over-treating and causing harm to somebody. One of the other things that 
always that comes up right away and I try to def defer to you guys. I try to explain to them that, you know, I'm gonna be part of their journey, but once they're done with their surgery, you guys are kind of their main person who's following them and taking care of them, almost like an oncologist, but for the can but for thyroid cancer. So some of the other things I tell them you're gonna talk about is what does survivorship mean? So what's my long term? Do they need to see you every other month? Do they need to see you once a year? So what's the follow-up gonna be like down the road? So most patients with thyroid cancers will never see an oncologist because there's simply not a need. The patients who do see oncologists are those with maybe recurrent cancers that are not responding to more traditional treatments such as radioactive iodine and really need to be um, considered for targeted therapies. So the vast majority of patients will see you for the surgery, maybe at some intervals subsequently for ultrasounds to look at the neck, but they will be seeing their endocrinologist on a more regular basis. Some patients will need radioactive iodine if they're at higher risk of recurrence of disease. And that usually would be a consultation and then a treatment. But again, that doctor, they're not gonna follow up with on any kind of regular basis unless there's a reason for them to do radioactive iodine again. So once they have completed the surgery and maybe if they have done radioactive iodine, it's really about monitoring blood tests. So one for hormone levels and then two for a marker that we call thyroglobulin. Low levels generally indicate um, you know, a good response. Rising or elevated levels of thyroglobulin mean we need to look for any kind of recurrence. So they will be seeing us, the endocrinologist, um, maybe every couple of months initially in the first year after surgery. And after that, subsequently, we can stretch out the appointments maybe every six months or even at some point once a year for an annual checkup. So it doesn't sound like it's too bad once you get a couple years out. Right, the longer you get out and everything remains negative, the better. And you know, low stages we can consider cured by the initial surgery. Melanie, what about a person who comes to see you with a really small thyroid cancer? Do they have to have surgery? We have more options today than we did even 10 years ago. So the classic treatment and what we were doing up until recently for everybody would be to take out half of the thyroid. Um, which means you don't necessarily have to take hormone medicine after that because about 70% of people will be fine with just half of their thyroid. But that gets rid of it for good, it's considered a very low risk cancer. So two other options that exist today, one is something we call active surveillance. So kind of like what you hear about older men for tiny prostate cancers, we can do the same thing, especially for older people with very tiny thyroid cancers. We watch them with regular ultrasounds. Um, we would do every six months for the first two years and then once a year thereafter. And as long as they don't grow a lot or they don't develop lymph nodes, they can keep their cancer. Lastly, a newer option, though there's only very specific candidates for it, is something called radiofrequency ablation where um, I call it zapping, using really high radio frequency heat to kill the tumor. It's an option. I personally think active surveillance is just as good, so we don't really do very much of it, and your cancer would have to be in a very specific location for us to be able to do it, but it is something that's out there in addition if you really don't like the idea of only watching your cancer. So it's great to hear about these options. Um, I have another related question. In someone who you've determined they need to have surgery, do they need to have the entire thyroid removed? So it's a good question and one that's very individual to somebody's cancer. So if, if you have a smaller cancer that's confined to the thyroid and no lymph nodes, and I say smaller, definitely under two, probably even under three plus centimeters, and everything is well confined and we don't see anything else ugly, half of your thyroid being removed should be more than adequate for, for our treatment. Once it gets bigger than that, tumors that look like they're sort of popping out of the thyroid on the ultrasound, or if we see lymph nodes, those all really need the whole thyroid out, both for treatment um, as well as for monitoring afterwards. So Sarah, I see a lot of young people 
And actually, a great stat is that actually in women 20s and 30s, thyroid cancer is actually the number one cancer in that age group. How is this going to affect down the road my ability to have kids, you know, live a long, happy, normal life? So what do you tell them? I usually tell patients that by and large, they are gonna live wonderful, happy, healthy, normal lives. Patients have happy, healthy pregnancies. We are very experienced at managing thyroid levels in the general population with patients that are hypothyroid. So we are very, very good at managing pregnancies. People get pregnant very beautifully and we manage them throughout their entire pregnancies with thyroid hormone. That's really important to hear. What about for younger men? Do they have any issues with fertility at all? Absolutely not. Same applies. We get patients making families, being parents uh, in the same way. And even if they get radioactive iodine, what do we, what do we tell them? Absolutely. I tell patients within no guarantees, but within six months to a year, for sure, I tell patients, I am gonna do my absolute best to feel to make you feel your absolute best and feeling back to normal, at your best. So what if I have Hashimoto's and thyroid cancer? Is there anything different or is it just now I don't care about my Hashimoto's and I just am a cancer survivor? That's a really good question. If a patient has had a full thyroidectomy, their thyroid gland removed, they don't have Hashimoto's anymore. Um, so we would replace them and treat their cancer just the way we would. Um, if a patient has a hemithyroidectomy or half of their gland removed, we would still treat them for the Hashimoto's and for the thyroid cancer. But we're very experienced with treating both Hashimoto's and thyroid cancer, and so we do that a lot. So here would be a question as the surgeon. Um, let's say I have Hashimoto's and I have a smaller thyroid cancer. Would you recommend a patient maybe just take out your thyroid so you don't have Hashimoto's anymore? Or is there some benefit to me keeping half of my not well working thyroid in there? That is a very good question with a very nuanced answer. And I think it's really patient dependent. I think for some patients that don't want to do a lot of surveillance, that don't want to do ultrasounds for the rest of their life frequently. For some of those patients, they do feel better having their thyroid gland removed and we would replace thyroid hormone beautifully. Some other patients really feel that they want to keep their native thyroid function and they prefer to uh, just have uh, half of their thyroid gland removed. That's great.